Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pineapple Podcast. Today, I have Andrea Jones, and we're going to talk about the secrets of getting a really good property manager, because Andrea has been doing this for a long time. Andrea, welcome to the podcast. Thank uh, you, Mitch. Please introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure. I'm Andrea Jones. I've been a property manager since I was about 21 years old, which is many years. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I won't tell you how old I am, but it's been many years. <laughs> Um, so I've done nonprofit co-op housing, I've done social housing, I've done, you know, kind of every kind of facet, commercial, residential, so there's a whole background out there, it's a whole different world in every one of those aspects, and uh, it takes a lot to learn, you know, the ins and outs of, of the business, but uh, over the years, you, you learn to appreciate, um, you know, the tenants because they are obviously, you know, uh, the most important in it. Um, and it's not so much a property manager as a people person uh, because you're trying to help people live the best lives that they have where they live. You know, the way you frame that, I absolutely love that because in reality, um, the majority of tenants are good people. They are looking for a place to live. I just love the way you frame that. It is about people and they are the most important. And you have a little bit of bad apples, as they say, but you just deal with it, right? You do. You know, it, as they say, you know, there's one in 10. They're the worst tenants. And, you know, um, it's finding out what are the real issues, you know, and and some people, you know, They'll always find something to complain about because that's their way of interacting. You know, they may not have a social life. They may be alone. And so by coming up with any little maintenance issue, it's their way of staying involved and, you know, keeping in touch with people. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, Andrea, that uh, a lot of people, uh, investors really think about is, well, how do you hire a good manager or what is a good property manager, right? Uh, because the challenge is you have, you know, you have the corporation world, you have independent people that are sort of like managing several properties together. So if I'm an investor, especially a new investor, it's like, where do you begin in this journey? How do you pick a good property management company or person? So I've done a lot of hiring over the last year or so. Um, and what I certainly want to look for is, do they have experience, you know, and, and not just book smarts, you know, do they have hands on experience? And, you know, it could be a year experience. It could be 20 years experience. It doesn't really matter because the dynamics in a building really don't change. You know, in high rises, you've got boilers and fire systems and doors and windows and parking garage, right? So, you know, yeah. whether it's a small building or a massive building, it doesn't really matter. The dynamics are still the same. So does that person have that knowledge of the equipment? Generally, how it operates, they don't know how to, you know, yeah. operate it because that's yeah. why you have contractors, right? Um, right? Do they have the people skills? Can they manage their time? You know, are they follower throughers or are they just, you know, planners? Um, a lot of the systems that we use are computer generated and do mm -hmm. they have those computer program uh, background? You know, we all have emails and Excel is a pretty common program, but you know, there's other specialized programs out there like leads and Satisfax and Yardi and, and other accounting programs, you know, so what, what type of programs have they used and are they familiar with them? And, you know, do they seem like they're trainable? Um, do they do ongoing education to keep up on the latest trends and building code and fire code and elevator codes, you know, so those are all things that you look at when you're doing your interviews. Um, one of the things that I've tried to implement uh, is a, a mini test, you know, of pictures, you know, can they identify what an elevator room is, can they identify what pests are, you know, bugs and cockroaches, um, feral ants, um, you know, do they know what a plunger is? Do they know what um, different types of um, plumbing materials are, you know? So little quizzes like that give you an idea of their comprehension of what's in the building. Absolutely, that's quite a long list. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if uh, people really have that depth of experience to get to that level, right? So 
I think a lot of things are missed at times. Um, one of one of the interesting things I, I have is um, actually this is a very real life conversation I had with somebody where they are in one province, the building is in another province. <clears throat> They're using a property manager company, but they feel like they are getting gouged. They feel like, you know, they've set a term of any repairs up to $250. Uh, they don't need any permission. Uh, they feel like they've been getting bills up to $200 on a frequent basis. Uh, sometimes for things that they've, they've spent a lot of money on, because for example, they did a big renovation solved some electrical problems, plumbing problems, maintenance, spent something like 50,000. And they said they're getting bills for $200, you know, when they try to, to connect back with the property manager question or get confirmation on things, they're shrugged off, right? So, so it does have a lot of, um, you know, variables when it comes to people, which is a challenge in itself, right? So how would somebody I don't know if it's structuring a contract is might be the right question or rather how would they, they structure the agreement between property manager and landlord so that they get some good value. And if they're not working out well, what's the process to terminate somebody? Well, certainly you have to have your list of contractors and you have to go out and get your pricing. You know, if you have standard building stuff that you want uh, to be maintained, go out, get your three quotes. And then, you know, once you have your contractors established, then at the property level, then you have your checks and balances in place. So, you know, your administrator might be able to create a PO up to $100. Your property manager could do up to $500. Your senior property manager, uh, $1,000. Then your regional manager is $5,000. And then anything over that has to go through um you know the controller or whoever else is is upper management so those are your checks and balances to control your costs and make sure that you're getting your value for your dollar the other thing that you want to make sure is that you're not paying for the same service over and over again um you know that if they fixed it once that it is fixed and that it's not a repeat because there has to be some type of guarantee on the work that they do so you have to know what you're getting repaired and have it inspected. Your property manager shouldn't be sitting there in the office hiding behind a door. They need to be out walking the building. They need to be checking on the contractors, seeing that the work is done and before that contract gets paid that they're signing off on the work that it was done. So those are little things that you can do to check. Now, certainly in your contract, you know, you want to set out what your um, approvals are for spending limits and, you know, anything over a very large amount, you want to have your owner involved in that discussion. Um, owners can vary on, they're very hands-off or they're very hands-on. Right. Uh, I work with a group that are very hands-on. So we're in mm -hmm. daily communication. Uh, we have multiple discussions throughout the day, multiple emails throughout the day. So there's a lot of you know, hands-on work that we do. Um, and I'm at a regional level, but I'm still, you know, in the trenches following up on the day-to-day -day work with my trades, with the, the property managers, even the admin staff, you know, we work very closely together. And that's the key is working close and having that communication back and forth. Because if you don't know what's going on, nobody else knows what's going on either. <laughs> that is very true. You got to know your business, right? Uh, the, the investor sort of hands-off approach really doesn't work. You got to have some level of connection. You know, you got to check your bank account, make sure that the rents are being deposited. If you didn't see it uh, show up by the third or fourth day as as expected, send an email. You know, follow up with a phone call. Say, hey, what's going on? I didn't get this person's rent. Like, you know, and they may explain it. But the idea is they need to know that you are visible and that you're looking after your business, right? Yeah. Um, and now you were mentioning the rents. That's yeah. a key thing as well. You know, mm -hmm. we have our staff that, uh, you know, do point of sale purchase right at the office. So it's yeah. convenient for the tenants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rent is due on the first of the month. On day two, it's late and they need to be following up with those tenants that haven't paid. Um, doing those checks either in paper 
by your N5 notice or N4 notice um, to get your arrears collected, door knocking, phone calling, all those things to make sure that your rents are collected in a timely manner. Not only just collecting the rents, but getting it into the bank. You know, some of those tenants who might have fallen into arrears and have gone to LTB hearings, you know, they might have agreements in place. And if your bank deposits aren't on time, then when the accounting does the uh, checks, they might find that they're in breach and, you know, send it off to the tribunal to get a final order when in fact they did pay on time. So it's very key to get those deposits in on time because it can have a very big rippling effect for some other tenants. Absolutely. That's a key point. I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, you get a check, especially if some of the tenants are still old fashioned and they give you like 12, 12 checks. Don't sit on it. Don't go depositing it on the six or the seven because you forgot mm -hmm. to put it in there first, right? That's right. Yeah. And just for our viewers as well, Andrea, probably give us a sense. How many doors are you currently managing with, with, the, with the corporation that you, you run with? I have uh, 10 buildings or about uh, 2,800 units. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that keeps you quite busy, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, they're all, I have a property in uh, Burlington, it's a commercial and residential plaza. Right. And the rest are all high rise, uh, 300 plus units. So it's, it's wow. a big portfolio, but you know, I, I totally enjoy the work. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. And that's why I thought, you know, bringing you on today would be of tremendous value to our viewers because the challenge is a lot of new people come in, they don't really know where to start, right? Like, for example, if we have a building that's, I would say, maybe 15 doors and less, you can work with a property manager company that kind of groups other properties together. But if you're looking at 15, 20, 25, 50 doors, would it be better to have a superintendent there full time like what's your experience or ideas around that so i had a property it was 18 doors uh mm -hmm. it was a condominium um the owners there they they kind of oversaw everything that was going on we have a handyman that would you know be assigned certain things uh of course you've got your regular maintenance and and whatnot but uh you know you'd have uh the handyman keep an eye out on things when they're there um, I do drive bys once a week just to, you know, make sure the property was okay. Um, but, you know, if you've got a smaller property, um, definitely having a superintendent on board, even if it's part time superintendent, mm -hmm. that's key. Uh, superintendents are your eyes and ears in a building, and they are super, super informative and key to any business in, in, in your uh, maintaining of your buildings. Um, some of them are very old school where they can do plumbing and electrical and troubleshoot practically anything. Some of them even just by listening to the noises that the equipment's making, it's like, oh yeah, I know exactly what has to get done. Wow. And others are more just, you know what, I'm here and I'm gonna guide the trades around the building to the areas that they need to go. I'm gonna check on their work, you know, but more of the buildings are getting these building automotive systems and a lot of it is just watching monitors and dials and making sure that the pressures are you know within the acceptable limits so having a superintendent that's knowledgeable in the old tech stuff as well as the new tech stuff is important absolutely i mean that that's great advice for sure because i mean you know, we're coming into the space. And as you know, um, lately commercial, which is residential apartments, five doors or more, seems to be quite sexy in, in, in this uh, space right now. And people love it because again, it allows so much opportunities, right? You can fund it based on the property's financial performance. Um, it can generate cash flow. Uh, it covers a lot of expenses. It really establishes you as a landlord. So yeah, more and more yep. we've seen people coming in, right? Right. So the, the the key fundamental is they come in and we talk about, okay, well, does the building have an existing property manager or, or do we need to find one or can we do it ourselves, right? So to me, the can you do it yourselves, probably if you're into the duplexes, triplexes, even up to fourplex, I think that's where you can do it yourself because it's really phone calls. You know that the you pretty much will know the tenant. Uh, because, you know, there's just only a small number of doors, you can interview them yourselves. Uh, but once you start scaling, 
I think this is where you really have to choose wisely in terms of property management, right? Yes, definitely. Now, certainly on the smaller properties, you know, and everyone's with the cell phone technology and cameras and all that kind of stuff, you know, you, you, you have a tenant that calls up and say, hey, you know what, I got a leak. Well, you know what, let's do a face to face video chat. And, you know, I could be 200 miles away. And the tenant can show me what the leak is. And I know exactly who to call, you know, I don't have to drive there. So I mean, it's a time saver for sure. And, yeah. you know, when the pandemic hit, we all went to Zoom meetings, you know, and if I had to have a chat with a PM and we're walking through a unit, you know, they're yeah. got their phone and I'm, you know, doing the live walkthrough with them. So, you know, we could see what work ne needs to get done. And I mean, the advances on uh, the phone technology and having the meetings this way has certainly made it a lot easier for some of us to do our work remotely. But uh, going back to, you know, the, the property management and how do you find a good company? Uh, word of mouth is a huge one. You know, um, you've got companies that are out there that, you know, they can do the basics, you know, they'll do your financials. Are they super detailed? Are they on top of it? You know, are they doing their accruals properly? You know, those, those are things that, you know, you look at how well do they do their, their presentation um, references, you know, um, drive by and see some of the properties that they manage, you know, are they well-maintained? Are they run down? You know, some of these buildings that they pick up are old buildings and, yeah. you know, they might just be getting into them and there's a lot of work to go and get them back on track and, you know, online reviews, you know, do the buildings have lots of pest issues? Do they have lots of maintenance, you know, concerns listed? Right. Uh, take a walk through the property, you know, talk with some of the tenants, talk with some of the staff, you know, they don't need to know that you're an owner or an investor or anything like that. You could just be say, hey, you know, tell me what you think about this property. You know, I might, I might, you know, want to invest here. You know, um, word of mouth is a, is a big thing. Uh, the other thing that you want to look at is um, staffing reviews. You know, are there a lot of disgruntled staff? You know, how well do they treat their staff? Um, you know, do they disconnect at the end of the day? You know, you've got your on-call people, and but, you know, is everybody on call 24-7 or do those staff actually get downtime? You know, if you're on vacation, are you really on vacation? Or are you still kind of expected to answer your phone? You know, those are the questions that, you know, you want to find out, you know, if there's mm -hmm. a lot of turmoil or where is it because they're unhappy or are they getting burnt out? You know, if you're working 24 seven, seven days a week, you are going to get burnt out. That's right. So those Absolutely. are the things that, you know, you look at, um, you know, length of contract, you know, do you want to try them out for a year, see how mm -hmm. they do. Right. Um, you know, but you don't want to keep jumping property management companies. You want to try and establish a working relationship and make that a good working relationship. You're always going to have your bumps and bruises right at the beginning. You know, it's like, I want their support by, you know, the 10th of the day, but based on how things are progressing, you know, it yeah. might be more realistic for the 12th day of the month. Right. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm number reporting. of reports as well, yeah. you know, yes. they, I mean, we do lots and lots of reports. So, you know, how much of that reporting and how much information do they want to see every month? You know, those are things that you look at. Right. That's absolutely true. So that's on the day-to-day -day running of the business. A lot of uh, people as well, or investors, sometimes we want the property managers to be doing the tenant placement. And maybe we can chat a little bit about that. So what is the expectation around the property managers? Because sometimes you have uh, companies that use real estate agents. They pay one month rent. Uh, property managers typically charge, I would say, anywhere from 6 to 10%. Uh, we've seen some people higher at 15%, 12% and so on because they say they bring different value uh, in terms of the, the management. But in terms of tenant placement, I think, you know, for us, do we rely on the property managers to do that? Should we set it up with agents or should we do a bit of it ourselves? What's your experience in that? So, again, it depends on how big your buildings are. You know, you can have... Yeah your property manager kind of do it all. If, if you've got smaller properties, um, mm -hmm. do you have a marketing program in place? You know, do you do online advertising, Thumper, Padmapper, Kijiji, Facebook, you know, all yeah. those different mediums, you right. know, 
how much of that do you want to track? You know, do you want to want to know how many phone calls you're getting, how many emails you're getting? You know, there's systems out there that can help track it for you. But if you're just a small time investor and, you know, you, you don't want to have to pay a leasing agent, then, you know, look at how you want to manage that. Um, typically in one of my buildings, I could have 80 phone calls uh, in a day and twice right. as many emails, you know? Yeah. Is that manageable with one person trying to run, you know, the business as well? Probably not. So, you know, even if it's a part-time person to do your leasing might be something that you want to look at. Um, you know, you've got your applications to process. You've got your unit showings to complete. You know, if you've got someone on site that can do the showings, that's great. But if you don't, then you have to book in, you know, your travel time to go to the properties. Um, another thing that you can do if you're, you know, hands off is have everything online and do virtual tours. Um, you can have the units set up with, you know, pretend furniture so that people can see how your units look and they can kind of place their own furniture in it if they want. Right. So, I mean, there's lots of things that you can do to help market your property. Leasing agents, you know, some of them could get commissions. Um, on top of a, a minor fee uh, for them to sit there and answer phones and do showings and that kind of stuff. Um, commissions, again, it all depends on what you negotiate. Um, you know, I, I think on one of my properties, we're about $700 a commission, you know, but they also get, you know, an, a nominal fee for sitting in the office. Um, you know, there, there's so many different ways that you can set up leasing and, and um, you know, if you're looking to have someone do it all, you yes. really have to be able to count the number of doors. If you've got huge vacancies, you're probably better off getting a leasing agent uh, to work for you. Absolutely. So, I mean, those are great insights for sure, because it goes from, okay, let's do it ourselves, get the marketing, get the advertising, get that done and understand what you're doing, because... <clears throat> now you're into uh, checking their job, making sure the job letter is accurate, uh, doing their credit checks, so that they send you the credit report, and, and are you looking at that, right? So there's a fair amount of evaluation for sure in terms of choosing the right tenant, because ultimately yes. you've got to choose the right one up front, right? That's right. I know in the industry, you know, they used to say, uh, well, in social housing, you know, it's only 30% of your income that, it, that you're paying. But in the real world, you know, we're paying much more just because of the crisis, you know, yes. um, you know, if someone's paying 55% of their income towards their rent, they don't, you know, have much left. And, you know, what's going to be the first thing that goes, they're going to bounce the rent, right? Because right. somehow out there, it's, well, that's okay, I'll catch it up. But then next thing you know, there are two months in arrears and three months arrears. So doing your checks, you know, doing the your lease application, having those landlord checks done, you know, on where they're currently living or even past present um, residences that they've lived at. Um, doing your credit check, uh, what is the percentage? How much do they owe to credit card companies or vehicle loans? Or, you know, are there any collections that they have registered, you know? Right. Um, how many inquiries have they had on their credit check right you know because that can affect their score um, if they haven't had many cr uh, credit checks done then their score will be high if they had lots of them it definitely lowers the score so you have to look at that and know how to read it um, you know and that's something that not everyone knows how to read it's like oh yeah sure they got lots of income and no no issues but you know when they come right down to it they might owe a lot in debt and still be right. able to manage um, you know having those references checked you know if you're close by where they currently live take a drive by do they maintain what they have you know I know there's certain questions that you can ask and certain questions you can't ask uh, when you're doing a landlord reference check um, right. but knowing how to word it is is mm -hmm. key you know um, have they had any bounce checks you know do they pay the rent on time those are the key questions you know do you have any concerns with their tenancy you know do you know if they maintain their property well all right uh you know you can't get into um you know do they have a criminal record or anything like that you know um, there's certain questions that you really can't answer but uh you you do want to do your homework on your tenants because that can make or break you Absolutely. I mean, once they're in, then it's your problem, right? So that's right. And so, sometimes it can be very difficult. 
to get rid of them. Absolutely. And I guess some of the things too is like, you know, this is where as a, as a landlord, even if your property managers are doing everything for you, this is where you kind of do a recap, like talk to your managers, see what the interview process was for them. If there's any red flags, look at the reports yourself, you know, look at the credit scores, see if there's anything that's glaring to you because it's important to know, right? Uh, being a bit hands-on at certain points in time, I think is important, right? Uh, yes. You know, like we said, rent didn't come in, follow up because you're looking at your bank account on a certain day. Uh, tenant placement, yeah, you know what? If Even if you contract the property manager to do everything for you, you take a final recap. So this way they know that you're looking in, right? Because, you know, sometimes people want shortcuts and then it turns into a problem. So I think that's, that's, that's quite interesting. Now, the beautiful thing is when you get the great tenant, they're paying on time, there's no issues, they're maintaining the place as their own because at the end of the day, it's their home, right? So those people are perfect. But what happens now when you get imperfect, imperfect uh, tenants or maybe things change in their lives and suddenly the stress is falling on you because the building isn't kept properly, maybe they're loud suddenly, uh, they're out in the corridors, you know, there is a process for us as landlords to understand that you need to serve certain documents, especially in the regulated markets, which is pretty much across North America. Yes. Um, there is a time for serving, right? For example, you didn't pay the rent on the first. Well, on the second, you need to serve. Is it the N11? N4. Or from N4, the N4. Ontario, right? Yes. So, so every state has a certain timeline and a certain form that you need to serve. So that's where you need to become familiar. Maybe you can explain a little bit more about, well, they're paying their rents, but they're disturbing other people. How do you deal with that? Right, right. So there's there's lots of forms with the L2BA that, uh, that you can serve. Um, you know, if you've got a consistently late paying tenant, serve them the N8. Um, then they have to come up with an agreement to pay the rent on time. If they don't, then you follow through uh, with your L1 application to the board and then you know, you can ultimately get termination. But when you get that problem tenant, those ones are tricky because the key things that you want to do is make sure that you have documentation. So your documentation is dates, times, what's happening, if it's noise related, what type of noise is, you know, is it just day-to-day -day living? You know, do they flush their toilet 10 times a day? Well, that's just day-to-day -day living, right? right? But if they're you know, partying till all hours in the night, you know, you keep track of dates, times, what it is they're doing, how it's disturbing you. Right. And then you make that report to the property manager. The property manager completes an N5 and that puts that tenant on notice that they have seven days to stop the behavior and correct right. it. Right. And if they do, that's great. Nothing else is required. Let's say though, that they keep it going, you know, um, for the seven days, and then all's good for about six months, and then they reoffend. Then you want to issue your second N5. And again, you want to capture all of those details that were in the first N5 plus the new behavior. And then you issue that, and uh, then you can file with the LTB. But right. let's say that, you know, they're in total compliance, uh, sorry, that they're not in total compliance within those seven days. You don't have to wait for a second N5. You just file right, right away with the LTB. You right. get your court hearing date. Typically nowadays, uh, the landlord has to do everything that they possibly can to save the tenancy. So that means talking with the tenant regularly. You know, can you please stop doing the noise? Is there something else that we can do to muffle the sounds? You know, is there carpeting that will help stop the booming? You know, um, putting their speakers up off the floor keeping the volume down. You know, they, the landlord tenant board adjudicators want to see that you're working together to um, fix the tenancy and, and stop those problems from happening. But uh, if there's no solving it, then ultimately, you know, you would try for mediation to agree to a certain date or behavior that's going to um, make for an amicable uh, tenancy. Uh, but when that breaks down and the landlord just says, no, I'm not interested, then uh, mediation fails and then they go in front of the adjudicator. At that point in time, they have to present their case and they want to make sure that they have 
all their dots on their eyes and their T's crossed so that they can win their case. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Um, now, if it's an owner um, who owns the building, then they can represent themselves if they feel comfortable, or they would have a paralegal um, or a legal company uh, yeah. to manage that. Um, I've been on both spectrums. Um, mm -hmm. I've managed properties directly, and I, I was the landlord tenant board rep for uh, that company. And uh, so I've got lots of experience. So I know how to win a case. Um, you know, and again, yeah. it's having your documentation. Yes. If you have witnesses, you want to have those witnesses there. You know, if you have police involvement, you want to subpoena the police and their records so that they can wow. speak to any issues, you know, especially right. if the police are showing up at the property regularly. Right. Um, they can pull histories on what's going on with the property and they can give a good testimony. Um, so, you know, don't hesitate to subpoena in witnesses or even the police to, to give your case the full attention that it needs to win. Absolutely. So once you've gotten your order, yeah. Um, yeah. then um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can decide, you know what, I want to call my tenancy to the end, 10 days um, from the date the order is written, the tenancy is terminated. Nowadays, it's taking a while for the orders to come through, but essentially they set a date for the tenancy to end. Um, you know, and then if they stay, then there's a penalty um, to continue paying rent and that kind of stuff. And sometimes, you know, tenants leave, no problem. Other times you might have to then follow up with filing with the sheriff. And, um, you know, there's sheriff filing fees and you wanna make sure that all of those fees are captured on that tenant's ledger as well. So. You know, you've got your filing fee with the LTB, you've got your sheriff's fee, and all of those things ultimately becomes the responsibility of the tenant to pay. Some tenants want to keep their tenancy and they'll pay everything right up to the very end. Right. And others just, you know, they don't care and they'll walk away. And then unfortunately, you've got to send that to collections. But uh, make sure that you have your documentation in, in order when you're filing. Absolutely. So and what's your experience with, with going after tenants? Because a lot of the times I know for a fact that investors or landlords, they sometimes don't bother to go to small claims court or try to chase the uh, tenant, even though it might be six months of rent, simply because if the tenant didn't have the money or doesn't have any sort of assets, it's almost like you're consuming more time and more money, right? Sometimes, but you know, the collections will always sit there on, on their credit report. And, right. you know, eventually that may affect them getting housed somewhere else. Um, you know, having something in with collection agency, mm -hmm. you know, again, it can sit there for a long time, but eventually, you know, you, you will get your money. Right. So is it that you go directly to the collection agencies uh, or do you have to go to a small claims court? No, you can assign everything right over to a collection company. Oh, very good. And then yeah. the collection company would make the report on their credit score. So at least there's a record. So you, in, in effect, you're helping other landlords too, right? Because That's you want correct. to weed out the bad apples. Yes. Yes. Nice. So, I mean, th this is really important. One of the other things too I've heard is a lot of property managers, sometimes they say, okay, we've given them a verbal warning. Um, is it okay to start with a verbal warning and you document that in your in your files or just go straight to the forms and just hand out the form to them so that they know that you're serious about uh, this warning? It comes down to how bad is it? You know, what is the situation? If you think that the tenant just isn't aware of what they're doing and you think that they'll be okay, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, always, you can always give a verbal warning, but make sure you document it. So that when you do have to follow up, you can say, hey, on April 5th, I, I mentioned to you that, you know, you, you did this behavior and um, you were OK, but, you know, you've started up again. So now I'm I'm sending you a written warning, you know, and again, you know, it's up to the landlord or, or their agent to determine, is this behavior going to continue? Is it serious enough that I need to go directly to the forms or not? You know, sometimes people forget, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, I read that and I forgot about it. So sorry, you know, and, you know, having it in writing can make it that much more serious. But if if you think that it's just going to go in one ear and out the other, go right to the form. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's brilliant. That mm -hmm. is indeed brilliant, because like we say, we have from running a duplex or single family home all the way up to, to buildings. Right. So we have 
quite an array of people investing in this space. Yeah. But on the commercial side, it's really where you need to make sure your systems are in place, your processes in place, the managers are, are well trained and they understand you as well as a landlord, because not only is it a tenant relationship, and more so I think the property managers own the relationship with the tenants, you need to own the relationship with your property managers, right? Um, what are some of the frustrations or some of the, the, the tips that you think we can share with, with our with our landlords to make sure that they're building the right relationship with the property managers? Uh, communication obviously is key. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even if it's a once a week email check in, you know, hey, is there anything that I need to know about? Um, right. Bringing serious issues to their attention is, is key. You know, yeah. because that pinhole leak that you've ignored for two days suddenly collapses some tenants ceiling and you know now there's multiple thousands of dollars of damage so yeah. you know being aware of what's going on uh keeping on top of maintenance even small items is, is key um you know you you don't want to come across as being you know the mean property manager all the time you know because yeah that, that doesn't make for a good working relationship you know um don't make promises that you can't keep you know if you mm -hmm. say that you're going to order a tub and you know you didn't for four weeks well you know that's not going to make the tenant happy now if you ordered it and it's backlogged for six months and you're not going to be able to get the supplies let the tenant know yeah. you know let them know that there's a, a supply issue so that they're prepared and that you're not going to get yelled at because right. there's nothing worse than being yelled at by a tenant and saying oh well nothing I can do, you know? So letting them know what's going on is key. And, you know, whether it's uh, the upper management level or at the tenant level, communication is your biggest friend. Absolutely, when you get a good property manager, I mean, ultimately as a landlord, it's your job to make sure and keep them as part of your team, you know, incentivize them, like you say, reach out and talk to them regularly so you know what's happening in their, their world, in their business. Uh, so that they know that they, they got a good partnership. <clears throat> what about in the case where you're no, no longer happy with the property manager? Maybe you feel they're not responsive. Maybe you feel they're trying to take advantage of you on the building side or, or you know, as you say, maybe they're repairing the one block every two months. Who knows, right? You know, how do you, how do you manage that? Is it like you decide, okay, I'm cutting ties, in which case you need to get a replacement? And the question would be, well, within that geography or that population, really and truly, how many property management companies or people are around, right? Right. So the key is letting them know what they're not doing and what you're not happy with. You know, putting that in writing, saying, you know, you've missed these deadlines for the last four months. And, you know, I expect you to adhere to these. So I'm putting you on notice. And if they fail to, then it's like, okay, I definitely need to start looking. Um, it could be the individual too, though. And, you know, mm -hmm. if they're not happy with that person, there might be someone else that can replace them. So that might be the solution too, instead of, you know, you're happy with the company, but just not that one property manager. So you can say, you know what, I'm not happy with them. I want someone else assigned to my portfolio. That's yeah. always an option. But if you're definitely not happy with your property management company, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, the accounting, the paperwork, the follow-up, things just not getting done in general, then, you know, you put them on notice, let them know what they're not doing. You give them a time frame to comply by and you start your search. You know, if you know that you're definitely not going to uh, continue on with the relationship, you start your search as soon as you can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a brilliant tip because ultimately remember we're running a business. Landlords are basically entrepreneurs and you got to, you know, you have a conversation documented because when it's great, everybody's happy. When it's not great, there's a process to follow. And all you have to do is stick to the process, right? Because again, whether you're in a corporate world, your job environment, you're in the same space. Documentation, communication is key. Making sure that your key performance indicators are there and being done well. And ultimately, you know, both parties would be successful simply because they know you have clear expectations. And you know they have clear expectations as well. And once 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 there's clarity on that, the the relationship would work. If it starts off bumpy, 
don't get frustrated. I think as Andrea says, you know, build a relationship, go back to them, say, hey, I'm not happy with this. I'm, you know, I'm thinking maybe we do it this way. Can we work that way, right? So by challenging and building with each other's sort of relationships and ways of working, eventually you get into a harmonized um, relationship, which is the ideal, you know, that's basically right. what it is. Right. The other thing to consider is, you know, and again, you have to make sure that you're familiar with what your contract says, you know, most contracts have an exit of 60 days, right? So yeah. you want to make sure that you give your proper notice um, that, you know, once you've given your notice and, you know, you're requesting all your paperwork that you know exactly what paperwork you need to be provided so that you're not losing records and missing information um, because new management company will need all of that documentation. You know, yes. it, is everything scanned into the system? Do you still have paper files? You know, you want to make sure that everything is transferred over. Right. The other thing that, exactly. you know, you might have to look at is what about those employees? You know, are mm -hmm. they um, employees of that management company or are they employees of uh, the landlord under a different company? You know, um, the company that I work with, you know, they have um, separate employment uh, company that um, the superintendents and the cleaners are hired under. And the property managers are a different company. So, you know, management companies will come and go, you know, we're just agents, you know, uh, the companies that um, are the employees hired by, right. that company's not going to change. So you have to look at, you know, where those agreements are and who's who all is being affected. Absolutely. I mean, that's brilliant, you know. Andrea, I must say, thank you very much. The, the conversation today is, is amazing. I think we could go on forever. Uh, you do bring a lot of value in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the expertise and the experience that you have managing uh, so many properties for so long. So again, you know, I want to thank you. I want to thank you on behalf of the viewers. Uh, if viewers wanted to get in contact, contact with you, we'll share your email information in the comments down below. Okay? Sure. Thank you. So, thank it's been a pleasure, you, Andrea. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Okay, bye.